What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. Today's video is an introduction to one of the most important ideas in biology, an idea that helps us to explain the relationship between our DNA, our proteins, and our traits. This idea is so important that it is often referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. This is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or more precisely, a 3D model of a small segment of a DNA molecule. In a big way, our DNA makes us what we are. It gives us our traits, controls our development and cellular processes, and even influences our behavior. That's because DNA contains our genes, and a gene is a sequence of DNA that ultimately codes for a particular trait. DNA is found in all living organisms. This molecule contains a code, written in G's, A's, T's, and C's, that is essentially a set of instructions for building a living organism, and although the specific instructions are different from one organism to the next, the language in which this code is written is exactly the same for all living organisms. But how does our DNA give us our traits? How is this molecule able to make us what we are? The central dogma of molecular biology helps us to answer these questions. DNA is an information storage molecule. Specifically, it holds information that the cell can use to assemble protein molecules. According to the central dogma, genetic information in the cell flows from DNA to RNA to proteins. And these proteins perform a huge variety of functions inside our cells, functions which ultimately give us our traits. Humans have about 24,000 different genes, sequences of G's, A's, T's, and C's, coded in our DNA, and each one of these genes codes for a different protein molecule. This means that human DNA contains the information necessary for building roughly 24,000 different protein molecules. By contrast, the average bacterium has about 3,000 genes, and can build about 3,000 different proteins as a result. Our mitochondria, which also contain DNA, have less than 20 protein coding genes. But no matter what kind of organism we're talking about, the big picture is the same. An organism's DNA contains the instructions for building proteins, and the specific proteins that an organism can build using that DNA determines the traits and physical features of that organism. During this unit on genetics, we will learn a great deal about this process and the relationship between DNA, RNA, and proteins. But before we learn how our cells use DNA to synthesize protein molecules, let's review the basic structure and functions of proteins themselves. Protein molecules are the workforce of the cell. They are the molecules that do most of the important jobs that need to be done. The job that a particular protein molecule does is determined by the shape it takes when it is constructed by the cell. Here we see a few three-dimensional representations of some of the many protein molecules known to exist. Our cells make literally thousands of different protein molecules, each one structured to do a specific job inside of our cells. And the jobs that protein molecules do inside of our cells are very, very important. Among the more important functions performed by proteins are regulating chemical reactions, fighting disease, transporting substances into and out of our cells, providing structure and support, and carrying oxygen through the body. This last one is performed by a protein called hemoglobin. When we inhale, oxygen diffuses from our lungs into our bloodstream where it binds with the protein molecule hemoglobin. This way, the oxygen can be transported through our bodies in our bloodstream and can be dropped off at cells that require this oxygen along the way. This is just one of many examples of the important jobs done by protein molecules inside of our body. Just like carbohydrates and nucleic acids, proteins are made of numerous, small but similar building blocks. The monomers of a protein are called amino acids, and there are over 20 different kinds of amino acids. All amino acids are identical except for this part, the so-called R groups, or side groups, highlighted in this figure. This R group determines what kind of amino acid we are dealing with and interactions between different side groups determines the overall shape of a protein molecule. As you can see, these different amino acids have different properties depending on the side group it contains. Some are positively charged, others are negatively charged, some are polar, and some are nonpolar. As you might imagine, a positively charged amino acid might be attracted to a negatively charged amino acid, and two positively charged amino acids might repel each other. It's these kind of interactions that cause a protein molecule to get folded and bent into its final shape. 
Our bodies can manufacture most of these amino acids internally, but nine of these amino acids must be consumed in our diet because our bodies are not able to manufacture them. These are called the essential amino acids because they are an essential part of our diet. Without them, our bodies would not be able to build certain protein molecules. Most meat products contain all nine of these essential amino acids, but you can also get them by eating a combination of beans and corn. Whenever you get them, it's very important to make sure that you get all of them. Amino acid monomers join together in long chains like beads on a string. In this figure, each colorful bead represents a single amino acid, and here we can see that R group or side group that determines which specific amino acid we have. This long chain is a polymer that we call a polypeptide. A chain of amino acids is called a polypeptide because amino acids bond to other amino acids with something called a peptide bond. The prefix poly means many or multiple. By itself, a polypeptide chain is not capable of much, but then again, we're not quite done building our protein yet. Proteins are said to have four levels of structure, and the specific order of the amino acids is only the first level of structure. Next, the chain gets coiled and folded as a result of hydrogen bonding, much like how water molecules stick together as a result of hydrogen bonding. After that, this coiled and folded polypeptide is folded again, and that's the third level of structure. Finally, this bent, folded, and coiled polypeptide that we've got sticks together with a few more bent, folded, and coiled polypeptides, and this is the thing that we call a protein molecule. Each individual polypeptide makes up a subunit of this larger protein molecule. Depending on the order of the amino acids involved, this bending, folding, and coiling, and combining can play out in many, many different ways, and this is why proteins can take on so many different shapes. Remember, this shape is what determines what job this protein will do when it is completed. And the jobs that proteins do are really, really important, as I've said before. Earlier in this video, we talked about the protein hemoglobin and how this protein helps our blood to carry oxygen to cells that need this oxygen in order to conduct cellular respiration. Proteins also make up important structures in our muscles and in our hair and nails. Some proteins embedded in our cell membranes help us to transport materials into and out of the cell, while others help our cells to receive chemical messages by acting as receptors to which these chemical messages can stick. Proteins called antibodies help our bodies to identify and eliminate disease-causing agents like bacteria and viruses, and help to keep us from getting sick as a result. Enzymes, which are also proteins, help our cells to regulate the many chemical reactions that occur inside of our cells. There are even proteins that help our cells to build more proteins, and proteins that help our cells to copy our DNA, and these cellular construction workers will be a big focus in this particular unit. Cells are the basic unit of life, and the function of any given cell is determined by the proteins manufactured by that cell. The information for building these proteins is coded in molecules of DNA, and information is passed from DNA to RNA to proteins, proteins that perform the functions that ultimately give us our traits. Sometimes these proteins function on their own, but often they work together with many other proteins, forming a protein complex capable of carrying out important cellular functions. We've seen many examples of this so far this year, from the proteins that help our cells transport materials across the cell membrane, to the proteins that make up the electron transport chain, which helps our cells to synthesize ATP during cellular respiration. So proteins are pretty darn important to living organisms, and to understand how living things are able to manufacture these important molecules, we need to understand this important relationship between proteins and our DNA. This kind of knowledge helps us to better understand ourselves and what we're made of, and one day this kind of knowledge is likely to help us discover new forms of medicine and technology that will improve the quality of life for all humanity. And that's why genetics is one of the fastest growing fields in modern science. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, and feel free to go back and watch this video as many times as you need until you feel like you understand why the central dogma of molecular biology is such an important concept.